welcome to The Near Memo, a weekly conversation about search, social, and commerce. What happened, why it matters, and the implications for local. All right. Well, that's unfortunate because I know you'd have a lot of things to say about data privacy, which has been a topic that has come up again and again. It's It's been a uh, an issue that has gained more and more consumer awareness and more and more people are concerned about. And there's been this debate between personalization and privacy with the uh, advertising industry, digital industry saying consumers absolutely want personalization and survey after survey saying consumers are very concerned about data privacy. And in the wake of the Roe v. Wade decision, the overturning of Roe, privacy takes on a whole new character because the data that are captured from search histories, text messages, ISP data and location data, mobile location data becomes potential evidence in prosecutions of of women uh, who are seeking abortions or who go out of state to to seek an abortion. And we realize not everybody agrees with our perspective about the the travesty of that decision. But what this does, regardless of what your politics are, what this does is it raises the profile of data data privacy even further. And there's a current federal act pending that does not look like it's going to pass. Um, and I don't, I can't reproduce the the name of it right now. But it's been sort of a, it was a bipartisan thing. And now in the wake of Roe, I think there's some disagreements about it. But what I, what I, I wrote a piece this week talking about how I think all data needs to be opt-in. All personal data sharing needs to be 100% opt-in, sort of a, a la Apple's app tracking transparency. I think that's not going to happen at the national level, but you may see states, certain states enact legislation like that to protect people who might otherwise have their data used against them in some in some in some context. So that's that's kind of what I think where where we're going to get we're going to see this go, which has implications for all these platforms and digital marketers across the board. I'll just chime in and say, even if we take the health conversation out of personalization and privacy, um, the the. I think it's important for people and governments to understand that Google is leaning really hard on hyper localization uh, rather than personalization. And in many ways, um, hyper localization could be personalization or is personalization. And that's especially true if you live, let's say, in a single family home um, and um, perhaps do something that um, not health related, but like you go to a gun shop or you go to a gun range, and then you happen to also be at a location where, you know, some uh, violent crime is committed. Um, The fact that um, your data, your hyper localization was here, and then uh, the same profile also appeared here, and the same kind of profile also appeared there, if, if only three people or one person is living where you live and doing searches where you search, then that hyper-localization is personalization. Now, if you're in a high rise with a bunch of people, that makes it a little bit harder um, because the, the uh, GPS coordinates are all kind of the same and stacked. Uh, but in some cases, uh, hyper-localization and personalization are the same. Do you agree or do you disagree? No, no, to- totally agree. I mean, one one of the things that I, I mean, I was I was very involved with a lot of the location intelligence providers a, a couple of years ago with all the exciting things that they could do with mobile location data. You know, it's a it's a it's an indicator of intent and all the online to offline attribution that you can do and all the ways in which you can use mobile, you know, the ad identifier or uh, IDFA to tie different media together from an attribution standpoint during the customer journey. I mean, there were a lot of exciting things that were possible given um, this this kind of data now that could knit together the entire digital puzzle that people, marketers have had historically difficult time doing. But now all of that becomes very sinister in the context of subpoenas and warrants and governments trying to surveil you and trying to use this data potentially against you. I mean, there's all this advice about women 
uh, deleting period tracking apps, that will not that will not do anything to 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 stop this. That's just one one layer. But your mobile location data, your search history, all of these things, there's there's profound implications now. And you know, if you look at what's going on in China with the extent of government surveillance using all these digital tools to profile and categorize and potentially preemptively um, stop people from doing certain things, traveling, whatever it is. I mean, it's pretty scary stuff. And so I think what we need in this country is we need some very, very aggressive privacy rules that are probably not going to be forthcoming from the federal government. And I think it all has to go ultimately to opt in. It all needs to go to a very simple kind of app tracking transparency like opt in where all personal data, location, everything, everything is is consensual, not uh, opt out. I mean, I, you know, I read an article uh, about T-Mobile starting to sell data, its consumers data to uh, to marketers uh, in terms of what apps are on your handset and what they're what they're being, you know, what 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 apps are being used. And I tried to go through the opt out process and it's not easy. These companies play hide the ball. So the idea that uh, opt out is there and everybody who wants to opt out can opt out is absolutely disingenuous. But, um, you know, I can rant on for this. But I, uh, my point is only that that the Supreme Court has has upped the stakes with data privacy and uh, it, we need a we need a fundamental, fundamentally different um, regime now from what we had. We need to move from opt out to opt in entirely. Well, and I'm sorry that Mike Mike cannot say anything. Cindy, you have to advocate on Mike's behalf. Well, I agree. Um, and I'll point out that in, in many cases, especially related to privacy, but also related to um, intellectual property rights protection, uh, Europe is far ahead of us on this and is already um, um, writing laws, testing laws, um, that, for, for instance, limit uh, GA3. Um, potentially, we might see a dissolution of the map pack. Um, and Mike wrote about this earlier this week, right. um, I think, or yep. last week. Um, and um, all of that is because Google is such a behemoth um, that um, it, it seems like they're becoming the arbiter of who wins business. Uh, based on who is at the top of the, the search ranking or at the top of the map pack. That's absolutely that's absolutely true, and it's been true for a while. Absolutely, hundred percent. People are finally. Yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, yeah, people, especially in Europe and the EU, are finally getting fed up with it and saying this isn't fair. And Google's decision on who should be at the top um, might might be slightly biased, or or might be. Um, Giving or self-serving as the case may be. And you can see Google trying really hard to figure out and plan for this potential um, uh, changes that could be impacted uh, or could uh, be a result of, of um, legal action. So I think that a lot of what's happening with GA4 is to number one, um, they're going to be modeling um, traffic data, which um, could theoretically give them an argument to say they're doing a better job anonymizing. Uh, but also, I think that the modeling data, you know, their models might be generous. Um, and where people think that Google is stealing their traffic when we switch to GA4, all of a sudden, I think that their models might show that people are going to get more traffic and that they're going to. I hear I hear skepticism there. Skepticism in the in the accuracy of the data. Well, you know, self-serving is a self-serving death. Yeah. But but it'll also, yeah. it, it, I think that there, some of the intent is genuine, right? They want to do a better job of attribution, and attribution is hard when we have stuff happening um, in social networks and in uh, Google business profiles and on websites and in ads. Um, and so if Google can tell a better story about attribution, I think they're hoping maybe people will be less litigious and less worried about them as a monopoly, right? And also with the modeling, there's just a lot to win. You know, I always say, and, and I said this when they switched from old search console to new search console, when they scrap a platform and do a whole new platform, they don't let you just stay in there and keep things as is. 
there is a larger intent there. And we've been in GA3 and been adjusting without having to scrap it since the beginning. Am I right? And now we have to do a whole new setup. And same thing was true when Google went from old Search Console to new Search Console. It was along with the switch from um, keyword-oriented search to entity-oriented search. It went with mobile-first indexing, which is all about mobile or all about entities and understanding. At least that's that's my conspiracy theory. I, you don't have to agree. Well, okay. On that on that note, we're we're kind of out of time. But I mean, I think the theme of this is that sort of dramatic change is happening, both in terms of SEO and how to how to do SEO going forward, and on the back end in a corresponding way in terms of privacy and availability of data and how marketers are going to understand what's working. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, surveys recently that have have expressed dissatisfaction by marketers about performance of di digital channels, cost of digital channels. So there's there's a lot of people people going on and it's uh, not gonna end anytime soon, especially with the antitrust stuff pending in this country. We'll see where that goes in the next couple of months. So Cindy Crum, thank you very much for joining us. We'd love to have you again, of course. And Mike, uh, unfortunate that your sound cut out, but you'll be back next week with full voice, so to speak. And uh, everybody, have a great 4th of July if you're in the U.S. And if you're elsewhere in the world, have a great weekend. Uh, we will not be publishing on Monday, um, depending on when you're listening to this, because of the U.S. holiday. Um, have, a, have a great uh, weekend, everybody. Thanks for joining David, Mike, and Greg. To stay on top of the latest developments in local, subscribe to our newsletter at nearmedia.co. We'll see you next week.